Right, good morning. Thank you for coming to the Content Discovery Finds Your Path to Business session. I'm Kate Bulkley. I'm a media commentator and journalist. I'm based in the UK, and I'm going to uh, moderate this session. This should be a very interesting session. We've got an interesting group of people who are going to talk about content discovery from different perspectives. So hopefully by the end, you're going to get some sense of where we're going, although to be honest, <laughs> it's a very, uh, let's say, difficult, um, exciting, uh, lots of different things happening. So to be honest, I, no one really knows how people are discovering content. They're doing it all kinds of ways. So this is going to give you just a view onto some of them. I think that what we all know is that accessing content has never been easier in the sense that you can get on your PC, your tablet, your gaming console, but finding the right content can be really difficult. Um, we've, ha we'd have, we've had revamps of VPGs. We now, they now go backwards as well as forwards. We talk about lean back. We talk about lean forward content discovery. There are curation tools. Uh, we have recommendation engines that follow what we like and then give us more of what we like. We all know that from Amazon. We've got the TiVo set-top box, which does that as well. There's burgeoning social networking space with you know, Facebook and Twitter telling you what your friends are watching and why you should be watching too. And last week, we obviously saw Mark Zuckerberg at F8 about his plans to take social graph into overdrive with what he calls frictionless sharing, which has gotten a lot of uh, Twitter action, I might add. Um, so this is about how content discovery is changing and what some of the cool technologies are that are developing. Um, I'm just going to introduce everybody and then we're going to have, everyone's going to give a little presentation then we're going to have some discussion and we'll then bring you in at the end. Here next to me on the end is Anthony Rose. He's the CTO of ZBox. You'll hear more about that from him. It's a very new company and they're about to launch an app to make TV more easily social and he'll tell us more about that. Next to him is Tom Weiss. He's the CEO of TV Genius. It's a content discovery software company that was recently purchased actually by Red Bee, so we'll hear more about that later. Next to him is Evan Kraus. He's on the sofa in the middle. <laughs> Evan is the EVP advertising for Shazam Entertainment. Uh, Shazam, as many of you know, is a music discovery application that has obviously moved into TV and also is doing stuff with brands, so Evan's going to talk to us about that. Next to him is Philip, also on the couch, Philip O'Farrell. He is SVP Digital Media International for Viacom International, which is the owner of MTV. Uh, and next, last but not least, we have Bill Patrizio. He is Chief Executive Officer of Red Bee Media in the UK. Uh, they do a lot of things at Red Bee, which he'll tell us a little bit about, but he's going to give us kind of an overview start to give us kind of a view of where we're going with content discovery. So without further ado, Bill Patrizio. Great. Thanks, Kate. Thank you for the invitation. Great to be here with all of you today. At Red Bee Media, we um, are privileged, really, to do a lot of things for broadcasters, content owners, um, platform operators. And one of the areas that we focus on recently is this area called content discovery. Content discovery isn't a, isn't a new area. Consumers, viewers have been needing to discover content in ways uh, for, for decades and, and longer, but what has changed now is, is how TV is being curated, how it's being created, how it's being promoted, and how technology is disrupting the entire value chain of, uh, of, of television today. So we at Red Bee, on behalf of our customers, have embarked on a bit of uh, research. Uh, we want to understand not just the technologies driving new forms of content discovery into the future, but what are consumers saying? about their needs, their wants, their ambitions, what are their preferences for recommendations for social media. And what I'd like to share with you is just a couple of minutes of some video clips of some research that we did in the UK. Uh, these are unedited, uh, unprompted. It's real people saying real things about their TV uh, discovery, content discovery experiences and expectations going forward. So can we go to the tape? Red Bee Media is one of the world's leading media management companies, providing multi-platform technology and creative solutions to broadcasters, content creators, content rights holders, platform operators, and brand owners. Our industry is rapidly evolving, with new technologies and platforms offering more and more opportunities to engage and interact with audiences. In response, we have embarked on a journey of discovery into what the media landscape might look like in 2020. Here's a snapshot of some of our in-home consumer research so you can hear firsthand what today's consumers expect and want from the media industry of tomorrow. Google TV would be good because it has the search option which will search across all the channels. 
I like the idea um, in the future of being able to use a tablet to control the television. I had a demo of a Kinect TV and straight away I thought, this is for me. And I just wish that my television watching could be the same as it is with music now. I mean, I use Amazon, Amazon a lot and, um, yeah, if it's sort of, if, if say, we, we like watching Luther, I suppose if it came up and said, well, there's something similar to Luther, that, you know, something that we wouldn't think of watching, but it would bring it up and then we could think, oh, we'll give that a go. You could integrate it with a camera and it could see you coming in the room just switch on to something. That'd be good. So yeah, I quite like using social media, so I think if I was watching a programme and I could see kind of a side panel on maybe the device in front of me rather than on my TV, um, and I could have conversations with my friends via Facebook or I could comment on things while the programme's happening, I'd really like that. I suppose I'd quite like it to kind of know my patterns automatically without, you know, when you set a series record or something, maybe for it to monitor the kind of stuff you're watching, how long you're watching it for, and then recommending stuff to you? As long as it's, it's a genuine recommendation based on stuff that you like. Oh. If, if they're all going to start being able to pay to push a program in front of you, I certainly wouldn't like that. The thing I like about the cloud services is being able to store things and there's that security. I'd say to people that are making these new developments in TV, to just make it easy to navigate and easy to use and um, Taking into consideration personalising the features and also making sure that the search, search navigation is easy. So, I was seeing a lot of nodding heads by my colleagues on the panel. Probably some of you have your own uh, impressions equal to the to the ones expressed by those by those viewers. A couple of key themes are consistently coming up as we're talking to audiences about their preferences for content discovery. Uh, they want it kept simple. Don't, don't overcomplicate. Don't overcomplicate the EPG, the screen, etc. Keep it intuitive. Keep it simple. Keep it straightforward. The more it can be relevant to the individual viewer, the more powerful it'll be. And that means things for integration with social media. Um, they are keen to maintain an association with a brand. Um, it is important that the content that they do discover is curated by brands that they know and trust. So as a result, major broadcasters, global content owners, Apple, Google YouTube, all of these are viewed as trusted brands and, and give me confidence that there'll be a bright future for all of them to peacefully coexist. So there's, there's very, very clear patterns and trends of what consumers are saying. What does it mean for content? What does it mean for the content industry? Um, not a new theme, but the hurdle now is higher than ever to make your content stand out. Uh, you need to do a better job in interfacing and integrating with the viewer. You need to push content, pull, and continue to maintain a presence across multiple platforms, not just the main screen or over-the-top platforms. Relationships need to be deeper with your viewers. You need to create content with the second screen in mind. You need to anticipate how your content as you're creating it can be in fact interactive to draw the viewer and the consumer into your content experience. And there are ways to pursue monetization. Now it's still an area of yet to be determined what the details are going to be, but you need to experiment with new forms of monetization. You need to be personal in your approach and importantly the day of real, dynamic, uh, personalized advertising we see as on the forefront, where individuals can be pushed or pull advertising that's uniquely uh, uh, targeted to them based upon their social networks, based upon their behavior, based upon their viewing habits. So those are some of the implications we see for content owners and, and broadly our, our predictions for content discovery is, is the EPG, as we know it today, is going to continue to exist, but it's going to go through a mass transformation and revolution. It is likely, very likely, that the tablet uh, will serve as the remote and likely the source of the EPG itself. Motion technologies, the way we've all become accustomed to interfacing with our devices, motion technologies are going to impact uh, the EPG on the screen. Um, and increasingly, those EPGs will be personalized to you as a viewer. I think we're going to hear a lot today about social media. Social media is an important influence into the, the discovery process. 
Um, consumers want it to be additive and not disruptive. They don't want it in their face. You heard the woman on the, on the, uh, on the video say she'd like it on, not on the main screen, but on the, on the tablet itself. They don't want it to be too intrusive, but they do want it to be additive to the experience. And there are, I think, now about um, two billion or so likes, people on Facebook acknowledging two billion likes for television shows. And Tom will talk later about um, how the TV Genius application is integrated with Facebook so you can create an EPG with all the likes of your friends right on your EPG. And finally, the, the last message I, I think we take away as Red Bee Media is, is this thing called metadata, data about data, um, about the assets, and increasingly enriched metadata is going to be a critical driver. Importantly, there are so many different data sets out there in the market. The need for standardization and aggregation of, of those data sets is going to become an issue for the industry to overcome. And if we're successful in doing that, then I think search and recommendation will be very powerful. Cool. Sorry, I have to use this. Okay. Cool. <laughs> very interesting. Um, Bill, I mean, You've talked about you know how some of these trends. You've done this survey and things like that. Can you just say how many people did you actually talk to in that video? Was it like a small survey or was it just was it a, was yeah. It yeah, I think it was about it was 60, 60, 60. people okay. in the UK. All right. It sure. was across demographics. You saw young people, you know, older people. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, let's go on to Philip. Philip, you're uh, you work for Viacom, uh, MTV owner. Um, you're one of the big con biggest content players out there. Obviously, your demographic which tends to be a little younger, is one of the most demanding. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of how you're developing, how folks are going to find stuff in this ever increasingly bewilderingly populated world? So you're absolutely right. Our audience are the millennial generation. They're digital natives. And that spans everything from our um, preschool Nick Jr. brand through Nickelodeon all the way through MTV and some of the associated brands and then on to... Comedy Central and beyond, we have had to engage in the digital world from the evolution of the digital world, right back from telephony, SMS to screen, the whole, um, the whole revolutions that have happened over the last, let's say, 14, 15 years, and then obviously with the internet. Uh, and our audience have absolutely been expected of us to have all of our product um, connected and available and that's that often presents challenges both from a from a content owner and, and often with rights as well as an issue so we've learned a lot very early on and then i think really for us uh, and uh, echoing what was just said research is really important we conduct a great deal of research on how our audiences want to interact with our content and also with our own shows you know something like a spongebob which has got 20 plus million followers you know, we're, we're, on Facebook we're, or? With, on Facebook, yeah. Uh, I think it's 26 to be specific. 26 million followers. And you're one of them, yeah. <laughs> and interestingly, you know, that's not, that's not kids, that's um, young adults who uh, have an affinity with the brand. Mm -hmm. So yeah, social media is important but not key. Um, search is super important and has interestingly become less important in the last nine months. It's been a real wake-up call for us in that we would in the past see a massive amount of search influx based on our brands, whether it's a show brand or uh, an individual within a show or just talent in general. And that swing has changed now and social media has enabled a lot more of um, a balance as to where the audiences are coming in. The good news is it's actually brought the whole thing up a step. So it's not like search has reduced, it's, there's more audiences coming in because oh, awesome. of recommendations. So it's not there's, there's not less search, it's just they're just doing it it's, it's less reliant on search now that audiences come in. You've got um, to turn off the duck. It's going to drive me crazy. Whose phone is quacking? No, sorry. There's a phone quacking over there. I swear, <laughs> it's a phone quacking. It's a, it's a good ringtone. Quack, quack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, sorry, Philip. Sure. So then, uh, so um, recommendations, search, super important, hyper engagement, and then I hate all these buzzwords, but kind of this kind of hyper connectivity and hyper device connectivity is an absolute reality for us now. What does that mean, hyper device? It means, and I think it was just described, it's having the television set or, in fact, the laptop streaming, one or the other, but then another device, which is often a tablet 
And then another device, which is often the mobile phone, because not all of the friends have got the same connectivity and okay. not always on the same network. Okay. And I think that's become a real eye-opener. It's how you create that cyclical environment where people are moving between platforms. And then my job in this whole thing is to drive people to TV, because ultimately that's the business we're in. We're about taking our iconic brands and getting them out to the biggest possible audience. The best way of doing that is through television. However, we do need to understand our audience also want to consume that content on the go and in other areas. So mm -hmm. that's our world. We live it every day. Um, what we did was just pull together a few examples of, uh, of what I've described on screen. So it's a bit of a, sorry, it's a bit of an ad for content, but I'm sure many of you are content makers. So um, you know, from that perspective, I'm not selling you anything. It's, it's really just a bunch of our brands. And then you can see how we've got, you know, whether it's a Facebook page or a mobile app, that's a given, of course. Every single show that we produce has to have a digital environment. But then there's some other new things weaved in. So see if you can spot them. Great. <laughs> so there's a lot of different stuff there. I mean, if you think about it, you know, got localized SEO, web app, social media, Twitter tracker, blogger, and you know, fan. The there's a lot of stuff. Do you do you do it? For, does it work for every show? You, every every show has something like this, but you decide which show gets which different things. I mean, how do you decide what you do? So, I guess my my real focus on any any content is it's always going to be about great idea, great talent, great script, great content, no matter what it is. Mm. And some of those narratives don't lend themselves to all of these different mm. um, activities. The, I think the piece that, that rides through all of this is there's always going to be discussion around content, whether it's scripted reality or a, an animated uh, kid's character. So I think it's really important to create the platform and, and environment for discussion. And again, horrible word, but digital water cooler moment, that's the reality now. People are chatting and you see peaks online, you know, at lunchtime and the kind of 11 a.m. coffee break. So the answer is, yeah, there's always something. And some shows are completely um, absorbed in the digital world. And, and some of our iconic brands go everything from a soft toy through to uh, a VOD um, stream. So. It, it, there is a dependency, but ultimately everything does have discussion around it. So we need to act as an editor brand. Even, even products that we don't um, own, maybe something that's in the music sector, and a discussion around that is we as an editor brand should have an opinion and, and, and discuss but with that audience. But it's clear you're moving towards social. Social is really growing huge, yeah? Social is definitely a, a good element, but it's not the only thing. Of course, it's technology, there's content as well. Okay. So Evan, let's go on to you now. And uh, we'll come back to more about what Philip has thinks. Um, uh, you know, you've worked, I mean, th I remember Shazam when it was a music recognition tool. Obviously, you've worked for all kinds of people, from mobile platforms, now you're working for broadcasters, you work for brands. Talk us through what Shazam is up to in this space. And I'm going to go to the if podium. If you want to go to the podium, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Do you have this one off? Or do you have that one off? All right, we'll do them both. So uh, I'm going to try to move quickly because I think you want to chat, right? So, um, yeah. Okay. So I think uh, we, we've heard the second screen concept come up. I think most people would uh, agree that that is uh, that that is the definition um, or the future of interactive TV. Uh, I think one interesting fact that came out of a study that one of our broadcast partners did um, is that. 60% uh, of the folks that were watching primetime TV were interacting with the TV um, through, or I should say, using their mobile phone while they were interacting and watching the programming. But even more interesting was that 60% of them, or 62% of them, picked up the phone the second the commercial break started. Right? So we thought that was interesting, uh, and we're pushing into both angles of this. But really, uh, the significant scale, right? Interactive TV platforms just don't have the scale of mobile to phones. Um, there's also a much more engaging experience that we can develop on phones and tablets. Right? There's HTML5 technology and really advanced rich media technologies that we can incorporate into these experiences, um, which you know, is a key part of this. Uh, it's also not disruptive. And what we mean by that is I can engage via my uh, mobile device, whether it be a tablet or a phone, on my own. I can be in a room of you know, one person, five people, um, but that experience is, is sort of personal to me and it doesn't take over the screen. So I can continue watching the show and interact uh, and explore both sides of the, the experience on my own. 
Um, again, it's personal. This is something I'm doing um, and having my own experience. Uh, but it's also portable. One of the trends we've really been fascinated by is the amount of interactivity that happens after people Shazam a program or an advert. Um, we're, we're seeing them uh, experience it when they're on you know, their commute to work, when they're standing in line, when they're waiting for the dentist. Um, we're seeing that uh, the, the engagement and the sharing that, you know, about the experience is happening while they're not watching, right? And so Portable allows you to take that with you. So just uh, real brief, uh, we consider ourselves at this point with over 30 programs and 18 months of experience, um, a pretty big player in the space. I think most people would know us as the music uh, recognition service. Um, we've become pretty good at that um, as a result of the success of our service with the fourth largest app of all time. We have um, built a beloved brand. Uh, there's over a million reviews of our product in the various different platforms, and the number one word that comes up typically is magic. Um, that's helped us uh, surpass 150 million users. Uh, we're still adding over 1.3 million users every single week. Um, that has doubled in the last seven months, so um, our growth is, uh, is actually uh, growing. Um, and we have 18 months of experience in this space, so we know a lot about it. Um, we can add a lot of value to our partners. Um, just to give you an idea of, uh, of some of the, the broadcast partners and, um, and uh, show programming we did, uh, we took a very specific approach to partner with, uh, with content uh, and uh, networks and broadcasters, uh, really for one reason. We felt that uh, without a, a really solid experience, consumers wouldn't do this. Uh, and we felt it was important to partner to create really custom and deep experiences. So we've done this with network partners, we've done this with um, advertising partners, as I mentioned, we've done over um, 30 programs so far, and, uh, and our growth and uh, partnerships continue to sort of grow. So just real brief, to give you an idea of how this works. Um, so on the programming, uh, again, the advert or, um, or the actual programming itself, there's uh, a call to action uh, that comes up right, that allows the consumer uh, to be aware that there's, there's something I can do here, I can interact. Right? We then deliver a completely custom, what we call tag result, which is a search result basically, just using our audio recognition. Um, and that provides real depth of content and linking into various different experiences. So um, for anyone that actually has Shazam on their phone, if you want to take it out right now, I'm going to show a quick clip. You can actually Shazam it to get the full experience of uh, what we did with Grey's Anatomy recently. You're fired. You're no longer a doctor at Seattle Grey's. What do you think was going to happen? My heart's on fire. Oh my god, oh my god. Oh my god, Alex! The sinkhole collapsed. I'm going to get swamped with bodies. I can't find a pulse. What did you do? You're throwing your whole career away. <laughs> I do. Why is my pager going off every 30 seconds? They said it's something about your baby. ABC's Grey's Anatomy, two hour season premiere, Thursday, September 22nd on ABC. So in that instance, uh, they were looking to give people you know, a quick sneak into the video. And uh, what we're seeing with a lot of partners, uh, whether it be tune-in programs like this, whether it be actual engagement within the show that they're trying to drive, uh, the idea is that I'm going to see um, you know, very brief elements of content, uh, and I want to go deeper. right? And I might want to go deeper while I'm watching TV. I might want to go deeper later on. Um, and that's been driving a lot of our success. So real brief. Uh, so much for being real quick. But uh, to give you an idea of, of kind of the success we've had, um, in, in most instances, we've seen 500% or, or greater increases in mobile traffic than they saw when they promoted it themselves. Um, we actually saw a really fascinating thing when we started this, which is we were seeing people download Shazam for the first time, even just so they can interact with TV. Um, we did some studies afterwards uh, with one of our partners, and 84% uh, said they were uh, happy with the experience. Uh, and 92% were likely to do it again. Uh, and to take that further, just with one of our advertising partners, 27% of the folks that uh, Shazammed the TV commercial for Old Navy actually went shopping. Right? So they experienced other elements of content, but their main goal was to get people shopping. So we have seen literally on average over 65% um, or at 65% or over 65% of the engagement once people Shazam. Right, so the real you know, effort we're working on with our partners now is what are the reasons and what's the factor that gets people to Shazam, the programming uh, and or the adverts. And that's it. Very cool. Thank you, Evan. That was great. Um, yeah, that was very interesting. Did, did anybody get that extra content? Because I want to know what happens in Grey's Anatomy. Okay. <laughs> um, let's move on to Tom. 
Tom Weiss, yes? Let me, let me go and stand up as you well. Want, you want to go and stand I up? I like okay. standing up, I'm afraid. Um, he's <laughs> the CEO of TV Genius, content discovery software company. Tell us uh, your view about social and... Absolutely. So, I mean, I guess we've been doing social TV for about three years, I'm afraid. You know, I've got to say that after the 18 months. Uh, <laughs> but what I want to do is just share a little with you about what we've learned and what we can see, that what we can do, <clears throat> and some interesting, I guess, perceptions that we have about what's happening in the value chain uh, and why that might be. So the first thing you know, we've heard about this before. This was uh, a study done in the UK by one of our partners, GFK, over the summer. And it shows, you know, how many people are doing what you're doing when you're watching TV. So, you know, more people tend to be going on the internet than anything else, but there are more people on social networks than there are talking to people while they're watching TV. Uh, and we're looking at 47% of the 16 to 34s who are regularly using it. So that's half the people in that demographic are regularly using social media while they're watching TV, which is great, you know. Uh, and what people are doing when they're engaging with TV is they're, you know, they're going on Facebook, Twitter, things like that. I guess we would differentiate slightly between Facebook and Twitter. And we know they're not the only social networks. There are a lot of other local ones in different markets like Mixi and Hives. But they all tend to fit in one of these two categories. So if you think about something like uh, Facebook, generally what we're talking about is a private social network where what you're saying isn't public, but it's really personal. Uh, and you know, the statistics that Bill alluded to earlier, we've got on Facebook, there are, your average person on Facebook has got 160 friends and your average friend has liked three different TV shows. So there's a demo that we've been going around doing, and actually it'll be launched live by a customer later this month, where we go and we get someone to sign up and connect their profile with Facebook. And when we do that, we get about 500 data points of TV shows that people like. You know, from a recommendation engine perspective, that's fantastic. The user's never engaged with us before, but we've already got 500 shows that are relevant to them. Oh, this is just a typical example where you can highlight some shows in the grid that people like, uh, based on their Facebook preferences. And it's great. It, it, the, the amazing thing about this is it works almost everyone uh, from any market, they can come along and we're just matching it to a UK TV guide and it kind of works. And that's because you know, there's a lot of international content, particularly the American Studios content that a lot of people like, also some of the BBC content. Uh, and the only guys we found it didn't work were well, the, the guys from India because all they're interested in is Bollywood. But if you... <laughs> If you do it on an Indian TV guide there, then you, it does absolutely work because the Indian Facebook users are going and they're liking the uh, local Indian shows. Uh, so it's interesting. Quick way to personalise. We like that kind of thing. Uh, Twitter, we can do much more stuff in real time. So, you know, the, the difference, I guess, between Twitter and Facebook is Twitter is public and it's not very personal. It's people shouting out, hey, that's a load of rubbish. Hey, that's fantastic. I love it. Why aren't you watching it? Yeah. Uh, and one of the things I guess we've been doing is we've been scanning on Twitter. We've been monitoring all of the TV-related uh, activity in a number of different markets. And so this, for example, is the top list for the last seven days in the UK. The last episode of Doctor Who showed over the weekend, so that's, that's the key one. And it's very interesting. So Doctor Who is a show that's uh, repeated during the week, and you can clearly see the peaks at the weekend when uh, the first broadcast is occurring. But it's interesting to see that actually there are still tweets on the repeats as well. Yeah? So people aren't just tweeting when it's first out. They're also tweeting when it's been repeated again. And they might be tweeting stuff like, I'm finally watching this because I missed it at the weekend. Yeah? Or I'm watching it again. Isn't it even better the second time around? Uh, and the kind of tweet behavior we get is we get people tweeting in the build-up to a show. We get the peak when, people, when the show is actually on. But also we get a substantial amount of traffic after the show. And quite often that's people saying, hey, I'm watching it on a catch-up service. So people are doing it. And it's not just the most popular shows like Doctor Who and The X Factor, but something like Question Time in number five position is really not a very popular show at all. I hope no one who works on Question Time is in the audience. Uh, but it's not a tremendously popular show, but they encourage a lot of engagement on Twitter. So, you know, that stuff, we, we think it's interesting. In real time, you can see what, you know, what's interesting. Uh, but the problem with Twitter is that the audience who are tweeting about these shows are not representative of the overall audience. Okay, so here we've got two areas. So the green bars, they are research from market appreciation panels. So market appreciation panels, you know, it's a people meter, but they go in and they say whether they like the program or not. Most market appreciation panels end up averaging at about 8.3, because generally people don't watch TV shows that they don't like. You know, if they don't like it, they switch it off and they watch something else. And this kind of, you know, the shape of that curve on appreciation panel, that's, that's copied in every market you look at. If you look at Twitter, 
which is the blue line, it's completely the opposite. The people who are tweeting either really like the program or they really hate it. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a subset, we, we know it's a subset of the audience, but also it's not a representative subset of the audience. So one of the things that we're trying to do quite a lot is working with advertisers and people coming and say, well, hey, look, can we use this Twitter data for something else? You know, maybe to like sell engagement. Uh, but the problem is it's not really representative. So, you know, it, it's interesting, but it's hard for us to then make, uh, you know, a case to advertisers around that. And I guess, you know, this is one of the things that really interests me is how different people in the TV value chain are using the, uh, using social media. You know, at, at the back end, we've got the content creators, you know, the guys who are going out, you know, and, you know, everyone knows now that when you're developing a new show format, you'll look at social media. A lot of formats seem to be actually developed all around social media. You know, really heavy engagement there, you know. The networks, unless they own their own formats, we're seeing very limited involvement from the networks on social media. You know, and I guess one of the things, you know, I wonder why that is. You know, maybe that's a question to discuss earlier. The TV platforms, you know, people like Sky, UPC, you know, we're seeing almost no usage of social media. And I guess, you know, the, the, for me, I'm not quite sure why that is. Is that, is that a missed opportunity? You know, certainly there are a whole bunch of these parasites, you know, like kind of, uh, you know, Shazam and and Z-Box, you know, coming in around the TV industry and, uh, and, you, know, and, <laughs> you know, and building a position for themselves, yeah, where, you know, where they're gathering a lot of data, yeah, that traditionally something the platform might have owned. You know, they're gathering a lot of data, they're getting a lot of engagement, yeah, uh, and why is that, you know, why is that happening? You know, that's really where most of the innovation in social media is happening. I guess one of my questions is why are the platforms and the networks not doing that? You know, the advertisers, Yes, they're engaging a lot in social media campaigns for, you know, retail goods. They're questioning how they can use it in the TV space, and they're not. But the only guys who are doing it more than the parasites are the viewers, you know. The viewers are just sitting there, and they're tweeting, and they're going on Facebook, and they're going on Mixing, they're going on Hive when you're watching TV. And I guess, as a TV industry, that's the real thing that we've got to try and deal with. Very interesting, Tom, although I think we need to get into definitions. But uh, it's interesting, what you, that last graph, because, you know, the viewers are doing this a lot, and yet... The other guys aren't doing it as much, and maybe you need to catch up. Maybe we need to catch up with the viewers. I, I think absolutely. Yeah, um, Anthony, let's uh, let's let you let's let. Uh, would you like to? I don't know if you want to discuss yourself as a parasite, but uh, maybe in we the can. nicest <laughs> possible way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we prefer innovator. That's right. Um, so you're doing Zbox, right? And you're doing a, a, a TV app, which you haven't launched yet, but you're close to launching. So tell Correct. us a little bit about that. Yeah, so my starting proposition is people hate choice. You just want to be given something that magically is what you want to watch. Um, you need to do, if you're doing a recommendation, it needs to be better than random. And there's nothing to prove the point, like just wondering downstairs today where there are hundreds of companies that sell, I mean, content. But how are you going to choose? You know, normally as a viewer, it's one pound or whatever to buy something. Here it's tens of thousands, how are they going to get their message heard? And when there's essentially an unbounded set of content as we reach this new internet world, how do you choose what to watch? And there are only a few possibilities. Either a trusted source says, here's the one. Um, that used to be a scheduler that can now be the person creating the home page on the website. Or it can be the force of overall everyone, what they're watching, popular, so that's the most popular. Or it could be what specific friends are watching and saying you should watch this. Or it could be a recommendation service. And that seems to be pretty much the mix. And everything from here on, I think, is about tweaking the balance between those propositions. And, you know, what to me is interesting is if you look at the evolution of the BBC iPlayer and what I'm working on now, I think that tells the story very nicely and fits in with... Uh, the, the last chart we saw. So, you know, it used to be the BBC schedulers would choose what you watched on TV. They would put something on at prime time, and there were a few channels, and that was your choice. The scheduler or the trusted source. And then iPlayer was launched in uh, Christmas 2007, and the homepage only had choices from the BBC. There were six choices. So the BBC had reinvented the scheduler as the new, uh, you know, online scheduler, I guess. But very quickly afterwards, we added a most popular. And now the choice was you could take what the BBC wanted you to watch or what everyone was watching. And then we added a social piece in 2009. And that you could see what friends were watching. 
Um, so slowly, I think, the power play had shifted really from the scheduler even within the BBC to social. But when you go to a VOD site, if you're presented with a grid view of thousands of things to watch, for me, it's a design fail. There should be a few things that come to you in each of these three or four different ways. But I think the next stage in the story is the rise of the tablet, because in all of the uh, existing uh, recommendation systems, it's been the content owner who sort of owned the audience. It's been their TV set, their channel guide, their EPG, and they've described and, and controlled the way you got to their content. But that's all changing thanks to the rise of the second screen, where parasites or innovators are coming up with all sorts of new ways that completely disrupt the way, the path to content. And what I'm working on, my new venture is Zbox. It's a companion application which is free or on a website. And you can pick it up and the idea is you have it in, on your lap while you're watching TV. It acts as a remote control so it finds a whole lot of the latest connected TVs and can control the channel that's being played on them. And it shows an EPG, a program guide, in the traditional order, but you can also change it to view the programs your friends are watching. So completely scrambling the concept of the channel order. Or you can see the order in which the audience is watching. And it takes the real-time analytics that feeds it back in. So if there's an ad break and everyone ditches that channel and goes to another channel, you can follow the crowd. In theory, you can even follow some celebrity and have your TV change with them. You probably wouldn't want to do that. But Additionally, I think there's one other key point, which is, I think we've discussed here, there's two parts to the equation. One of them is taking people to a program, and the second one is keeping them engaged while they're watching. Because as you switch to these second screens, if your goal is merely to be content discovery, then that's great, but the person spends a minute finding something to watch. For the next half hour or an hour, they put it away or do something else. And so if you want to keep a consistent experience the user can return to, you need to help them find things and keep them engaged. And so what we do at Zbox is we use video fingerprinting and audio recognition and speech to text and all sorts of fancy stuff. We pull in all the major TV stations and our computers suck out the context. So second by second while you're watching TV, it's bringing bring you a stream of things related to what's on TV. You don't need to hold your phone up and work out and push the button and count to 10. It just comes to you automatically. And so you're watching Top Gear and Tom Cruise walks on and a little tag comes out as Tom Cruise. You get news and you can buy stuff. So, and you can chat with people. So it's a comprehensive second screen experience. And ultimately your TV screen might just be you know, far from it being a smart TV, uh, where the portal is on the TV set, we may see TV reinvented as the TV becomes a dumb monitor and your second screen device becomes the Uber navigation panel that between you and your friends and your trusted sources is flinging stuff to the TV or telling it what channel to play and the TV becomes a nice rendering device but all the control and power sits where it should be on your lap. Thank you. Very interesting. Now, unfortunately, you're not going to show us a demo, are you? I'm not. I, I will probably do a few private demos in the speakers area afterwards if anyone wants to have a look and doesn't have a camera. <laughs> okay. We, I do have a meet the speaker session right after this, so if you do want to do this, you can catch Anthony afterwards. I think we have our Jerry Springer moment. We start fighting. Yeah. You, now I think everyone needs to pick up a chair and throw it. Yeah. yeah. These are a little heavy. Yeah. Are you parasites or innovators? Um, so I think it's interesting what we're talking about here. I mean, there's lots of things we can pick up on. Let me just pick up on one thing Anthony said, and I'm going to bring Evan in. You, you know, it's interesting. He, his app seems to be something that, he, that happens. You know, in other words, it, he, it, he's picking up the audio and the whatever from the technology and the metadata, and then it just happens on the second screen. You are working very hand-in-hand -hand with broadcasters. Absolutely. And, you know, designing things for them to keep that specific broadcaster or program or whatever engaged. What's the best, you know, what's the best way to do this? I mean, or is there, there are both ways, or are there, is it, these just two different approaches, if you see what I mean? Because well, Anthony's saying, well, you know, you don't have to hold up your, can you don't have to hold up your phone and do something, it just mm -hmm. shows up. Yeah, uh, uh, that's a technology choice and a, and a business decision at this point. There's no reason that, there's nothing stops us from doing that. Um, the, you know, the today experience where consumers are used to, Shaz used to using Shazam is they, they are used to, basically calling it out and saying, okay, I now want to engage. And so we're continuing that metaphor. But as you can imagine, as we make a deeper investment in the tablet experience, you can imagine that you know, we, we would change that paradigm. But the way we work 
And the reason we're working with the networks uh, and the broadcasters and the content developers is, as we mentioned before, because we believe the consumer experience uh, needs to be, you know, magical and, and great. And the way to do that is, is leverage all the, you know, the million, millions of pieces of content out there. So uh, we don't consider ourselves a parasite. We consider ourselves a partner um, as much as we can. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. yeah. So Philip, when you look at this, you know, what these guys are doing, does it, does it, are you excited by it or do you think, oh my God, you know, the, you know somebody's going to be using the Zbox app or the Shazam thingy and they're not going to be doing what my digital team has is, is created for them. I mean, how does this all work together? Uh, or is it I'm, all good, basically? I, I think it's all good. It's all good. Uh, I'm excited by any um, technology innovations that can help drive audiences to my brands. And I think brands is the key word here. Shazam has built itself a brand now that's pretty well known in High Street. Um, SpongeBob, Dora the Explorer, South Park, MTV, you know, they're very significant brands. And ultimately, um, audiences resonate around brands. Um, and we also have to remember that a lot of what we're talking about here is very mainstream television. And we haven't started talking about junior kids, mm. preschool, mm. who were not going to be, they won't be sat there watching TV with, an, with a tablet. Their parents might have given them one with a, with a game on, if they even own one. And you know, our, our range of channels are in countries where there are no tablets. And we have very significant television audiences. So let's not just write everything else off just now. You know, there's still a lot of people watching TV. I think it's very relevant that um, research is conducted. A lot of research needs to be conducted, and very, very often, because things change very, very quickly. And the, the lowest common denominator can often be a very old mobile phone with a bit of SMS going on. And that's still, you're still going to be talking about millions and millions of people. And they're a long way off having a lot of the technology that we're discussing here. But they may well be able to go into an internet cafe and chat on Facebook or their local um, social network. So, you know, let's don't write everything else off. This, yeah. But this the, is all the great. Linear the linear yeah. channel isn't dead. The linear schedule, the EBG is Oh, also, there's, there's many tens of millions of people that will not be using this technology for a long time. Right, right. So don't forget that bit, I guess, is <laughs> one message. Exactly. So, Bill, I mean, one of the things that's come up is social is, like, key. I mean, Anthony's is social, Tom talked about social, although it's interesting, the thing about Twitter, you know, appreciation versus Twitter. I mean, what do you, is social the answer, really, to the, all this? Well, I think it's, I think it's part is of the answer. Social, the discovery it, it, app of the... Not, not exclusively. I don't, think that, uh, I don't think it plays for everybody, uh, but it will play a dominant role in discovery going forward. I think what we're hearing is, is, uh, is an industry going through a, a, a period of, uh, of rampant experimentation, um, you know, Anthony's proposition is very disruptive. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine a TV experience as Anthony described? It'd be very disruptive to the way we're all accustomed to that experience. The Shazam experience is more complementary and trying to add value through a richer and more immersive experience. Uh, so, so what, in the end of the day, will emerge? You know, time will tell. Uh, there are a number of technical challenges and standards challenges, but the fact that the industry is experimenting so rapidly, I think, is great for, for all of us and, uh, and, and will bring about ultimately what consumers want, which is a, a deeper, more interactive, and a more immersive experience with television. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, let's go to the audience if there's uh, any questions, because we're running up against time here. There's one here. And can we get a mic to this person here? Is there another one I can tee up? Anybody else? And there's one here. If we get a mic to him while we're getting a new, go ahead. What's hey, your name? Uh, Stuart Judge from the Mip Blog. Hi. Hi. Um, there's a lot of talk about second screens making you more engaged with TV. What about the reverse? Is there a worry that you're, you're only ever a click away from discovering Angry Birds or eBooks or other kinds of content entertainment? Is that a, a concern for the industry, that these devices don't just do this stuff, they can let you read all kinds of other content? Right. I can answer that. Yeah. Okay, I, Tom? I talk to so, I mean, one of the things, the, there was a, the, I, I showed a slide about what people do while they're watching TV. In the same research, our partners, JFK, they asked, how did that make you feel about the TV program? Yeah, uh, and I think you know most people felt that it improved the TV experience. Uh, it was a very small proportion of people who said that you know it makes it more interesting because they don't like what's on TV at the time. Yeah, but the vast majority of people, you know, it makes it better. <laughs> it encourages them to watch more. It helps makes them feel more engaged. So all the research is that actually what's happening on second screens, people find complementary to the TV experience. And the guys who find it distracts them and they want to be distracted is, is minimal. Right. You're not trying to create a, a distractive app, are you, Anthony? 
No. Yes. We, I, I think we see TV as it is today. We accept it. But the reality is you switch the thing on and the program starts halfway through. It's a bit of a rubbish proposition compared to video on demand where it starts at the beginning and the TV beams at you and you can't do anything and modify it and you, when, the, when the, you want to find out about the nice Tuscan olive oil they're talking about, you can't do it. So, but we accept it as it is, but it needn't be that way. Once upon a time we sat in a cinema together or we sat around the campfire and told each other stories or something. And you may see in a few years' time, television's this new system where, you know, yes, there's a high-definition picture on the screen with high drama, but the way you consume it is, in fact, engage with other people. As things occur, you can instantly get more information around it. So we shouldn't assume that just because that's the way we watch it today, it has to be that way in the future. Mm -hmm. I think the one thing, however, is that these propositions are all around live TV. So this is TV's new best friend. It's not people moving away from live TV, it's making live TV better, a new generation. Okay. And I, should, I should echo okay. that. Let's, let's be clear, our networks on the whole are all up in terms of audience figures. We've got some almost 400 million friends and, and followers for our brands. And 400 million. 400 million, and the TV networks are up. So take a, take a, you know, a sponge. Well, actually, I wrote down the, the stats very, very quickly. So South Park, 35 million friends, 18 million followers on Twitter. Who does? Sorry. South Park. Oh, South Park. Kenny and Co. SpongeBob, 28 million. Jersey Shore, 14 million. And all these shows, like, they're breaking, certainly something like Jersey Shore is breaking the, the linear tune-in records mm -hmm. for the entire network. Yeah. And then you have a, another version of that format just in the UK called Geordie Shaw, and that delivered the biggest ever TV viewing and the biggest online following for one of our shows. Mm. So disruptive, good. Ultimately, it's driving television viewing, and ultimately, that's where the advertisers are going to be for the foreseeable future. So, you know, it's all great, but it's, it is complimentary. Mm -hmm. Yes, Evan. Ten seconds just to add. Uh, they're doing it anyway, right? They're moving between 10 different things. So without this experience, you're not providing that sort of second screen engagement to give them a choice to get to it, mm -hmm. right? So. so you might as well, you might as well do it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Hi. Uh, just a, a simple answer that I would get to, to like, I would like to get from the panel. Okay. Uh, what is the, the age that kids are starting to be proficient in the use of smartphones and tablet devices? Just a number. My five-year-old so, daughter walks up to yeah. the TV and starts swiping it. Three, four, <laughs> preschool. Yeah. There's no mouse and keyboard dexterity. They're great on the tablet. Tablets revolutionized preschool, definitely. Anybody else? Um, everyone's familiar with that, that story of the, the three-year-old, the toddler, going up to the screen on the wall and going like this in front of it, trying to change the channel. <laughs> so at a very early age, it's, it's commonplace for them to get into the whole motion technology and interact that way. Definitely invest in rubber mounts for the, <laughs> for the product. That's a good business to yeah. be in, I think. And wipe, wipeable screens. Wipeable screens, yeah. Get rid of the vomit and the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, I mean, look, I said, you know, my three-year-old is better at Angry Birds than I am. But my one year, three year old. But my one-year-old is more interested in chewing on the iPad. So it's, <laughs> it's probably between one and three, I would guess. <laughs> Hence the rubber. Yeah. Any of you, Anthony? No kids. No kids. <laughs> Anything else? Another question? No? Way in the back. Oh, sorry. There's one there and there's one in the back. I can't Don't see. Don't worry about the microphone. Yeah. What is it? Anthony, what are you thinking about time shifting DVRs, TiVo, et cetera, with your Z-Box application? What about time shifting DVRs, TiVo, on your Z-Box application? OK, and then we'll go to this lady here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's a great question. You know, as people move from live to watching when they want and, in fact, where they want, of course, you need to go with that. The great thing about live is, number one, millions of people doing it at the same time, so the social is much better. Two, live television is standardized. Once you get into VOD propositions or PVR, every different set-top box or provider is different, so there's different problems with metadata. So the short answer is we're launching. It's all about live. And then shortly afterwards, we'll be adding audio listening on the client to sync with what's on TV, and we'll deal with PVR and VOD shortly afterwards. OK, and then there was somebody over here. Yeah, this lady. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Jess from New Midrange. Anthony, I just wondered, um, can you talk to us a bit about how broadcasters have been, um, uh, whether they've shown any interest in working with you on um, Zbox? And can you also give us an update on 
launch timings? Right, so it's a great question, in fact, you know, what, what's the uh, reaction of broadcasters? And in fact, the reaction of broadcasters have been fantastic. There's calls daily from broadcasters because they see this is something that's big, exciting, and how do they engage? And I think my take is that with CBOX, we know a little bit about all programs that are on television, but the broadcaster or the content owner knows a lot about their program. And it's a great synergy. As you, today, we see the rise of more and more companion viewing apps with a particular program in mind. So there's the X Factor one and the million pound drop. And as a consumer today, it's okay. You simply go and get that app when you want. But there are few of them. But it's not a scalable proposition when every second TV show has its own app and you have to stop what you're doing and get an app for that program, it's not gonna work. So what our take is, we build a platform and we can then work with broadcasters as you flip to their program or it recognizes the program that's playing, it brings you a broadcaster provided immersive experience. And the broadcaster engagement has been amazing. So when you look across the spectrum of broadcasters, some of them are fast, innovative, obviously the ones typically skewing to a younger audience, and some of them would rather prefer the status quo or are looking in a little longer till they engage. But we've been hugely impressed at the uh, incomings from broadcasters. Do you have uh, any deals yet with broadcasters or not? I can't talk about can't commercials, talk about unfortunately. And how about a launch date? You were launch date, launch. we've said October. So it's counting? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Counting indeed, yeah. Halloween. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then so late, later in October, we should launch. Good. And that'll just be in the UK? Or it yes? will launch in the UK initially and then rolling out to European and US territories early next year. Okay. And Evan, when are, you gonna, when are we going to see more Shazam stuff in Europe? Because you're both mostly U.S., I think, with a lot of the stuff you showed, yeah? Yeah, I mean, uh, Europe's our second largest market. Uh, the U.K., France, Germany are actually uh, second, third, and fourth. But um, uh, we, I just hired four people. So You just hired four people? Who just will be in Europe. Based in Europe, great. Yeah. So yeah, we'll we have see, 20 we'll in the States that started in the last six months. Okay, so we'll start seeing more stuff with, you know, U.K., French, whatever, broadcasters yep. doing things. Cool, that's exciting, all right. Um, I think we have to stop now, but I wanna remind you that there's a Meet the Speaker session right after this, right out there. So if you wanna meet these guys, and if you wanna see Anthony's <laughs> app, um, you can go out there and meet them, all right? But before we do that, could you please join me in thanking our panel, Bill Patrizio, <laughs> uh, Evan Krauss, Philip O'Farrell, uh, and Anthony Rose, and Tom Weiss. Thank you very much, thanks for coming.